All right, we're here with uh, Bob Lauer, the Lowry, the executive assistant, executive director of High School Activities Association. Thanks, Bob, for being with us today. You bet. So, uh, first, let's talk a little bit about you, because uh, you're doing all this work to help soccer get in the schools, and you're probably not going to be around to really enjoy the fruits of your labor. Right. Yeah, I've made a decision with. Uh, with my wife and I that uh, this is my last year here at the Activities Association. I uh, be my 18th year here and we've decided to uh, retire and uh, spend time with grandkids. Well, on behalf of all of us that love high school sports, thank you for what you've done. Yeah, I appreciate you've had, it. You've had a big impact over the years and it's nice to, I think, be able to look back and see the fruits of your labor because what you've done is, is really counted. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, and it's been a great job. It's a great place to work, and you know the opportunities that uh, that I have to watch kids participate and so forth. That I get to go and it's part of my job, and other people have to pay to go see that you know, and so <laughs> forth. It's uh, it's really been a fun 18 years. So it's uh, you know kind of been a struggle back and forth trying to get soccer in under the high school activities association. Can you kind of describe? what the process is for a sport to get sanctioned? Yeah, we, uh, <clears throat> for a number of years, we had a, uh, a constitutional amendment that was on the books that said 10% of the schools needed to be sponsoring a, a sport before the Activities Association would consider sanctioning that sport. And uh, when that rule was put into place, nothing had been added because what was happening was uh, the Activities Association would say, well, until 10% of the schools are sanctioning the sport, we're not going to add it. And what the schools were saying, until the Activities Association is going to sanction the sport, we're not going to sponsor it. So it was a situation where we deleted that, or that was deleted from, uh, from our rules and regulations. And then there was a study group that was put together to expand uh, opportunities and in particular for girls taking a look at uh, Title IX concerns and that type of thing and the decision was to add uh, competitive cheer and dance um, at that time for girls and the reason for that was we felt that we would get a different type of person participating rather than the same kids participating in something else. Uh, you get a, a, a different type of, of girl that is maybe interested in competing in that competitive cheer and dance. So. We're entering our fifth year now of, of competitive cheer and dance. And then from that, we uh, looked at uh, do it as a time to expand to other opportunities for both boys and girls. And obviously the uh, sports that kind of come to mind are soccer for boys and girls, baseball for boys, and softball for girls, uh, none of which at the current time uh, we sanction. And uh, after a considerable amount of discussion and that type of thing, the decision was to add boys and girls soccer. And the original intent was to add that, and we thought we were going to be in for about two or three years already. Uh, but schools are really struggling budget wise right now, and uh, we were originally supposed to start in 2008 9. Uh, that was delayed at that point in time, and it came back to the board, and now the decision is that. We're going to start it uh, next school year, 2012-13. We have some schools that currently do sponsor the sport, uh, and we are the only state in the nation that doesn't currently sanction the sport. And uh, we just felt it was time that uh, we provide a state championship for those schools that are interested in uh, in having the sport. Do you uh, you know you mentioned that we're the going to be the last state coming on my Do you have any ideas why that? Why that situation exists? Well, I think South Dakota by nature is very conservative, you know, and uh, it's just uh, we're a very rural state, you know, not that other states in the nation are not, but uh, I don't know if there's any one particular reason. I think budgets keeps rearing its ugly, ugly head, and, and money is a huge concern for our schools, and, and rightfully so. And it's far more important, although we feel our activities are important, they're educationally based and they're a part of the total education process. But uh, you can't have the co-curricular activities going on and not buy math books. Yeah, you know? exactly. And so there's some decisions that have to be made there. And they're tough decisions that are made by school administrators, 
uh, our legislature, our governor, and so forth. Uh, there's only s so many ways to slice the pie, and people have to make difficult decisions. Yeah, you know, and that's one of the things that we've talked about from the soccer side in uh, having been a self-funded program since 1998, and having done pretty well, actually, over that time. But uh, do you think that, are you aware of any states around the country who are, who are having some of the programs do a little more self-funding than, than go all the way through the school budget? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to name specifics, but I mean, budgets are, are a big concern across the country, you know, and, and we don't necessarily control and regulate how activities are funded. We do say in order for them to participate in our state tournaments and that type of thing and be involved with our regular seasons, uh, is that it has to be school sponsored. Now it's up to the local district as to whether that funding of that particular program is through tax dollars, fundraisers, uh, donations. There is an attorney general's opinion on the books that says that it's not permitted to uh, pay for play for uh, sanctioned events through the school. Uh, now pay for play is in the eyes of the beholder. What does that mean, you know, and so forth. Uh, but uh, right now there is an attorney general opinion that says that co-curricular activities are a part of the constitutional amendment that guarantees every student in the state a right to a free public education. And so uh, that may change, you know, and so hopefully it doesn't. But uh, I know we have a lot of schools, not only with, uh, with soccer, but we're seeing now programs such as golf and cross country and some of the other sports where they're having to do fundraisers and, and that type of thing to, uh, to fund those type of programs. Uh, one of the things that I've kind of tried to encourage our schools to do is I don't think it's necessarily fair or right to have, okay, if we're going to have this program, they have to do all their fundraising, but we're going to pay for this program. I would rather see school districts take a look at what their total athletic budget is this is the amount of money that we have in our budget to pay for that uh, and then go out and fundraise for the rest, you know, rather than saying this particular program's got to raise all the money but we're going to fund this entire program uh, through tax dollars and, and that type of revenue. Uh, if my total athletic program cost me $100,000 and I've got 90000 in the budget, then 10000 is going to have to be fundraised and so forth rather than 90000 is going to go for these eight programs, but these two programs are going to have to raise the other 10000 Yeah, you bring up a good point because that just really it's a fairness and, mm -hmm. and kind of an ethical issue. Of right. So um, speaking of uh, the, the soccer going down the, the road then, uh, can you tell us if any decisions have made been made concerning when the seasons are going to be? Yes, they will be in the fall. Uh, Originally, we had made a recommendation as a staff that we would play boys soccer in the fall and girls soccer in the spring. Uh, and the big reason for that was some of our neighboring states are playing in the spring. Uh, the other thing is we've got a lot of activities going on in the fall currently and that's where when we added competitive cheer and dance, that's where that went. And so we felt to kind of balance things out, we would try and run boys in the fall, girls in the spring. Uh, but there's a nationwide move to make fall soccer kind of the traditional uh, season for both boys and girls. And I think you'll see most, if not all, the states eventually put boys and girls soccer both in the fall, much like basketball is in the winter and football is in the fall and track is in the spring. It looks like soccer is probably going to end up being the traditional season is going to be the fall. So that's where we will have both boys and girls seasons. Okay, that's good to have because there's all sorts of speculation about what's going mm -hmm. on. So as we get moving along here, um, do you anticipate maybe someday having uh, three classes like we have in basketball or are you going to stick mainly with two? Yeah, basically we have an advisory committee that was put together for soccer and we have advisory committees for all of our sports. And uh, we put an advisory committee together that was made up of coaches, school administrators, uh, officials, and that type of thing. It's a committee of five or six people. And uh, what we, uh, we've got everything laid out, but we really can't determine how many classes we're going to have until we know how many schools are going to actually be involved with the program. 